Jesus did not come preaching, keep these roles, do this, do this, do this, do this. Right? Why do we end up there? Uh, I'll give you what I think my answer is. It's easier. It's easier to control people. It's easier to, to know something. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, I, take note of this. It's... Yeah, it's why you have rules for your kids. That's a good point. Go ahead. I'll let you do it. Is it all taken care of? Oh, thank you. It's looked at and it's fixed. Right? So it's, it's easier, isn't it? But think about the way Jesus lived. Is that how he lived when he was on earth? Let me ask you this. Does he really even need to come to earth to accomplish that. We had that, didn't we? Yeah, you know, the Old Testament is big on lists, isn't it? New Testament has a lot of lists, but they're different than the Old Testament lists. Very different. Scott. You can't do this, 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 and this, and this. And it goes on and on and on and on. And after a while, when your child matures, you can you can do it out of love and compassion and understanding. Because you know what they're thinking according to the list, and you've also been there yourself. So there's a growth that's supposed to happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an illustration we're going to get into. I don't know if you've read ahead. I think you've probably read this book before, but we're going to talk about immaturity, right? Yeah, absolutely. How, how would your relationship between two of you be if it was based on a list, providing a list? Still working on the list. Still working on <laughs> I, I had a young girl, I was shoeing her horse, and she was telling me, you know, I'm that rather simple girl, and yet my boyfriend, he just... I, I only have a few demands and needs, and he won't pay any attention. He won't even memorize my needs. And I should have kept quiet, but that's not me. I said, well, you want to know why he won't memorize it? She said, why is that? I said, the moment he figures out your list, you're going to change them. <laughs> At first she was mad, and then she laughed, and she says, you know, you're right. <laughs> But what does she want? What do I want? Right? It's not about this list. It's I want Amanda to act as though she loves me. Right? And that list may change from day to day. Right? Because my needs change. Right? And vice versa. So my point is, Jesus didn't come reiterating this, these lists. He comes living a life of service that's completely giving of himself to everyone else. Now, compare that to where we were at last week, where these great orators, these great philosophers of the Greek culture came, and what comes with fame? Prestige. Let me ask you, you go up to, I don't know, where are we, where are we going for lunch today? Well, you all are invited for here, but... You, you go to Cousin Basil's, right? And there's a 40-minute wait. And Ben Roethlisberger walks in behind you, and he says, I'd like a seat. You're waiting 40 minutes. Is Ben waiting 40 minutes? Uh-uh. He isn't waiting 40 minutes. Right? What are they going to do? They're going to ask Mike and Brenda to leave so he can have their seat. Now, when you become famous, when you have a following, what? You have all these people to take care of you, don't you? And you know what all these Christians were they doing? They're saying, I follow Apollos, and they're lifting Apollos up. And the teachers and all the people are saying, I have the answers to this. I'm correct. You should listen to me. And Paul says, wait. The guy we follow, when that kind of argument was taking place, right before he went to the cross, when he should have been saying, can I have a few minutes of peace 
to get my head wrapped around the final steps of why I have to do save your sorry souls? That's not what he said, is it? He got down and he washed their feet. That's the guy we follow. So, the illustration that Paul used that I suggested we lose the power of because we, we wash it through our own perceptions was the cross, right? He says, listen, Christ set the example through the cross. To the Jews, a stumbling block. And what died on the cross was cursed. To the Greeks, foolishness. Only dirtbags die on the cross. Right? That's the example. That's the power. I hope you highlight it. I have it highlighted in my Bible, verse 24, the last phrase. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So, human wisdom segregates. Godly wisdom unifies. That's the message of Scripture. What happened when Adam and Eve sinned? God promised them this is what's going to happen. Yeah, you shall die. Dad, I remember you gave a talk. Five was looking. I don't know why I remember this. Death is what? Separation. Separation. It's not the only place I've heard it, but for some reason I remember you as a little kid. Give him a lesson on that. Death is separation. It separated Adam from God, Eve from God, Adam from Eve, Adam and Eve from their kids, Cain from Abel, Abel from Seth, right? On down through. Separation. You should die. What's the work of Jesus? To unify. That's why division is so problematic. The answer, verse 24, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. It's not on our wisdom. It's on Christ. Questions or comments? Let's finish this transitional um, section. Would someone read 26 through 31, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Okay. This is hard to swallow. I grew up proud of the fact that I've chosen to follow Christ. You know what separates me from the world? I've chosen to follow Christ. Does that sound arrogant? I think it is. Some heads are shaking now. It's okay. You, you don't have to agree, <laughs> agree with me. I think it is. Why? Who's the difference? I am. I had to deal with this in my life. What if my life was drastically different? What if I had been left in Texas? You know what I used to think? I would have found a way. You know what I think now? Paul's calling wasn't the same as everyone else's. 
Cornelius's calling wasn't the same as everyone else's. The Philippian jailer didn't get the same calling that everyone else got. You know what the difference is? God. Jesus. Now, can you overemphasize either side of this equation? Yeah, that's the difficult part. That whole, you know, Jesus is fully man and yet fully God. How can that be at the same time? I'm saved by God and yet I make decisions. What? It's hard to get my... And, you know, we get back to the idea about making things easier for us. It's a whole lot easier just go one side or the other of that pendulum, isn't it? That's not what we see in Scripture. Here's my point. If I'm going to boast, it's where? Thirty-one. This is my highlighted verse for this section. If I'm going to boast, it's where? In the Lord. In the Lord. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you. <laughs> Paul says, this is part that's hard to get. You weren't saved because of your superior faith. You weren't saved because you were better people. You weren't saved because God loved you somehow more than anyone else. Because you deserved it. You were saved because of what's our answer for everything? Jesus. Jesus. Right? And Paul points out, look at yourselves. You know, and remember, he just had finished this. Where is the wise? Where's the great orator or philosopher? Where is the scribe? Where's the one has all the answers? And he points out the insufficiency of all of that. Is it the case that Paul is pointing to arrogance as one of the significant causes of division. I think so. I think so. He says, 30, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He's saying it's because of God who's put you in Christ Jesus. Now, I think sometimes it's possible for us to get uncomfortable with that idea because we say, well, if, if I think that I have no part in this, then what do I do? And even more important, we get back to Amanda's idea about controlling people. If Stephanie thinks that God's in charge of her salvation, what might she do? <laughs> and we better make sure Stephanie stays in line. Right? I came the whole way up here for that kind of abuse. <laughs> the first amen of, of the year comes on the statement, we've got to keep Stephanie in line. <laughs> and Scott will repent later. <laughs> um, these things come through Christ now when it comes to that idea the underlying principle is that if you belong to Christ it's going to be shown in a redemptive a reformed life you're going to live like Christ Right? Now it gets easier when we make a bunch of lists. It gets harder when we consider that he gave his life. Not just on the cross. That is huge enough. But he gave his life. Right? Living this amazing servitude that was beneficial to people at their core. That is different 
then I have all the right answers, or I follow the guy with all the right answers. And if you, you don't agree with me exactly on this point, then you're wrong and I'm right. Right? There's where the division comes in. Questions, comments? Paul's, uh, Paul, Paul's, Paul's points powerful? Wow. Yeah. Um, verses 1 through 5. Would someone read those for us? And I, brethren, when I came to you, came out with excellency of speech, or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you that saved Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Thank you. Highlighted phrase for this segment. The end of verse 5. But in what? Power of God. Paul says, I don't come preaching with all this human wisdom, with all the right answers, with all the, the greatest way of presentation. I come with what? The power of God. Right? Jesus Christ in demonstration of the Spirit. We'll, we'll talk about those two as, as we um, follow through here. Now, verses 1, where he says, I don't come with you lofty speech. I mentioned this, that Corinth itself is a, the Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians, is, as well as the entire New Testament, um, is a piece of literary gold, right? The way they're constructed. The, the, and we lose, it's still powerful for us, but we lose a couple layers of the wittiness of some of our books through the language, the play on words and the amazingness of Scripture from that way. And I think of Paul in Acts 17 at Mars Hill, right? He goes to this place at Mars Hill where they debate all of the latest philosophies and the deities and who's correct and who has the great philosophies. And Paul says to the Corinthians, I came with nothing but Jesus Christ. But who does Paul quote more than anyone in Acts 17 at Mars Hill? Is it scripture? No. It's Greek poets and philosophers. What? I thought, Paul, you said that you came knowing nothing but Jesus Christ. Let me ask you. Every quote that Paul uses in Acts 17, who does it point to? God. Right? Did he use reason to get there? Yeah, he did. Is there a contradiction here? I told you a couple weeks ago that I've been told by several people that it's sometimes taught when we're teaching our te preachers that as long as you're preaching the truth, nothing else matters. In fact, I was in a preacher's meeting not that long ago with about eight preachers or so. And this was an idea that was brought up. Hey, as long as you're preaching the truth, nothing else matters. Is that what Paul's saying? This is the passage he goes to. 
let me ask you this. Was that the philosophy of Jesus Christ in his ministry? Did Jesus just come and say, here's the truth. Take it or leave it. I've heard this preached from pulpits before. We've got the truth. Here it is. If you don't accept it, that's your problem. Is that Jesus' message? Again, why does he have to live the life he lived if, if truth's enough? Send the truth. Right? Why did he talk about shepherds and about agriculture and about fishing? In fact, why was all of Jesus' sermons, they were way more stories than they were Bible verses? You ever notice that? Jesus was a storyteller. But then how does that fit into what Paul just said? We can't remove what Paul said from the context in which he said it. We're in the cultural context, in the specific context, the division, where people are following leaders. And Paul says, I'm not going to be one of those leaders you follow. The power is God's. It's the same as the previous passage. It's not in how well I present it. Now, it would appear to me, Paul put great effort. I know just enough about oration and about writing to know that this didn't happen by accident. Right? He put great effort into it. What's his point? It's not my wisdom. It's not me that you want to follow. It's I know nothing but what? For I decide to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And him crucified. You see, I'm currently reading through N.T. Wright's uh, book, um, The Day the Resolution. Yeah, Resolution. <laughs> That's today. <laughs> the Day the Revolution Started. And N.T. Wright, um, I think, does a great job of drawing out this idea that when we make the cross solely about cleansing of sin in the sense that we won't be held accountable to sin for sin, we strip the gospel of most of its power and importance. Jesus dying on the cross was showing that we could live differently. Right? That's his message. We're cleansed from our sins, not just in the sense we're not going to be held accountable for them, but we're not enslaved to them, and therefore they don't have to destroy my life and tear you down with me. It's a revolution, transformation in the individual's life. I decide to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul's going to get to two points. We won't be able to get them both covered today. But it's important for us to insert them here because to understand what he's saying about Jesus crucified. I'm nothing more than a servant. I'm nothing more than a servant. It's not about me. Right? And secondly, it's by the Spirit of God. Now, I, I laid down some heavy things about having the right answers and things like that. Um, who is the group that we know of in the time of Christ that knew more scripture than anyone else? Who was it? Pharisees. Pharisees. Were they the most righteous people at the time of Christ? Supposedly, yes. <laughs> I love your answer. They sure thought so, didn't they, Kevin? Right. They had all the answers. They, they lived the most about. 
Now, those were the people that Jesus was most flattering of, right? In fact, Jesus said, you all need to be more like Pharisees, right? That was his message. Wait. Yep. <laughs> oh, like 14 times, not 14, but Matthew 23 alone, it's like seven times, right? Yeah, whoa, whoa unto you. And that was, you brood of vipers, you know. I preached one time, there was a horrible incident in the congregation where I was attending. And um, so I was asked to, to give a uh, Bible study series on Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. In other words, how do we present the truths of Scripture in love? And I said there was, there was an unfortunate incident that had taken place, and, and that's why I was addressing it. So being that this incident had taken place, there were those who disagreed with the, the way I was presenting it, and this is what they said. I was saying we need to be, have kindness and consideration in our approach. We need to understand people. And two people, two guys in congregation says, is that the way Jesus dealt with people? I mean, that, they were both. I said, well, do explain what you have in mind. Is that, that's not the way he treated everyone now. See, see? It's what you have in mind. He called them broods of vipers. I said, who? did Jesus call broods of vipers? The Pharisees. Jesus' harsh statements all come back to the people who had all the answers. They quite frankly knew all this, most of the new scripture better than anyone around them. Listen, if they knew scripture better than anyone else, and yet they were that dissatisfying to Jesus? Were they lacking something? Love. Which comes from what? The fruit of what? Spirit. Yeah. Paul is going to put two points, and Lord willing, we'll get into these next week to address these. I'm nothing more than a servant. Don't follow me. And it's got to be according to the Spirit. We have God's word. So did the Pharisees. We've got to make sure we're acting according to his Spirit. And his Spirit is guiding us. I'll conclude with this idea. When the Pharisees used the word of God, did it unite or divide? divided, right? Constant. They used the word of God to do that. That's Matthew 23, where you see most of those, whoa, you scribes and Pharisees. That's, that's the premise of where he's getting at. When Jesus used the word of God, did it divide or unite? United. The way he says his whole work is Ephesians uh, 2, Ephesians 3, right? We have to not only have the words, we have to have the Spirit of God. And um, he addresses that in the latter part of this chapter. S Wisdom from the Spirit is the title, um, man-given title above the next section for my book. Lord willing, we'll continue there. Thank you for your attention.